This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. This is the third lecture on limiting factors, linear programming. Uh, and I hope you remember where we're up to. That uh, we set up the equations for the constraints and for our objective, uh, and we put the constraints on a graph. So any answer must be inside or on the edge of that red area, the feasible region. However, the last bit, of course, uh, certainly for example one, is to decide which of all the possible um, combinations of S and D will give us the maximum contribution. And watch me carefully here, this is the bit where some people get a bit upset over, uh, but let me get some space, because we've done that bit, so I'll remove those. And what we do is we write up the equation for the objective function. And if you look back, uh, we have that. It was the total contribution, whatever happens, is 6s plus 9e. And we then put that on the graph. The trouble is we don't obviously know what the final contribution is going to be. But you should, I think, know from school that whatever the contribution is, you know, it may end up being 100, it may end up being 200 or whatever. But the lines, the combinations, it'll be a straight line again. But whether it's 6s plus 9e is 100, or whether it's 6s plus 9e is 200, or whether it's 6s plus 9e is 300, Although we'll end up with different lines, the angles, the gradient, the slope of the line will be the same. And as you'll see, that's all we actually need to know. And so what we do, pick any contribution we want. I'll pick a contribution of ooh, 90. Suppose the contribution is 90. Just suppose. I have no idea. Might be 90, might be 900. No idea at all. But if it were 90, 6s plus 9e would be 90. And again, that's a straight line on the graph. 2.6 a line. So if s were equal to 0, 9e is 90, e would be 10. If e was equal to 0, uh, 6s would be equal to 90. S would be equal to 15. Let me put that on the graph and then I'll be in a position to explain why uh, I'm doing this. S naught and E10 ah, is there. E naught and S15 is about there. Join them up. And uh, I'm deliberately doing a dashed line to make it clear this isn't a constraint. This is my objective line. Now then, this is the bit to listen to carefully and make sure you've got. Any combination on that dashed line would give me a contribution of 90. But again, I don't know what the contribution is going to be. Uh, maybe the contribution will be 100. But if you repeated the exercise with a contribution of 100, you'll uh, get a line like this, which would be exactly the same angle, exactly the same angle, slope, gradient, whatever word you want to use, but the more the contribution is, the further out it will be. Again, you know, maybe the uh, answer turns out not to be 100, but 110. Fine. If it were 110, the line would be exactly the same angle. But it'd be that bit further out. Well, again, I want the maximum contribution possible. And so what we do, now this is hard for me to show on this screen. 
But we take this line, we use a ruler, and we move it as far away. This is, you don't draw this, this is imagining me keep moving the line. We move it as far away as we can uh, from zero, but keeping it parallel to that first line and see how far away we can go without uh, leaving the feasible area. And if you carry on moving it out, keeping it parallel, the furthest point away, without leaving the area, is point B. Now, which point it is depends, obviously, on the angle of the line. If the angle of the line was like this, move it away, the furthest point away is point, point C. If the angle of the line was like this, maybe the furthest point away is point A. It could be any of them. But because we know the angle of the line, in this particular case, the furthest point away is point B. And so point B is our optimum, our best. Now, I did say in, um, I think, the last lecture, that it's extremely unlikely these days that you could be asked to draw the graph. But there have been cases where you've been given this graph. Well, it's there in front of you. Uh, and you've drawn the objective uh, function. Um, but they're testing that you know that we need to move it out, keeping it parallel, and find the best corner. So I do hope that made sense, but we're still not quite there because even though it's at point B, of course we need to know how many S's and how many E's that represents. And it's too dangerous to read off the graph. You know, however accurate the graph is, you know, with mine, it looks as though A is about 30, B looks to be, oh, I don't know, 4, whatever. Uh, but you mustn't read it off the graph. You are expected to be able to solve arithmetically whichever, uh, what the values are, whichever of those corners it turns out to be. Now, uh, point B here is where the labour line crosses the materials line. And of course, two lines only cross at one point. And because we know the equations of the two lines, we can work out what the value is that satisfies both the value when they cross. So let's do it. The two lines that cross here, materials and labour. Well, the materials equation was 2s plus 4e equals 80. The labour equation, 5s plus 6e equals 180. And again, I know it may have been a long time since school, you may have hated it then, but if you have two equations like that, you should be able to calculate what the values of S and E are that satisfy both equations. Now, there are in fact several ways you can solve it, and it doesn't matter, there's only one answer. I'll do it the way that I've been to. Uh, but it's entirely up to you. If you've learned a different way, absolutely no problem, whatever you feel happiest with, as long as obviously you get the right answer. There's only one answer. And what I'm going to do is this. If I number the equations one and two, I'm going to multiply the first equation by 2.5. I'll tell you why in a minute. But if I uh, multiply the first equation, if I multiply everything by 2.5, 2.5 times 2s is 5s. 2.5 times 4e is 10e. 2.5 times 80 is 200. And the reason I chose 2.5 is I've now got two equations which both have 5s in them. 
And so what I can do now is this. If I subtract the second equation away from that third one, what happens? 5s minus 5s is 0. 10e minus 6e is 4e. 200 minus 180 is 20. And of course, if 4e is 20, e equals 5. And now I know what e is, I can go to either of the equations and work out s. If I go to the first equation, 2s plus 4e, well, e is 5, so 4e is 20, is 80. Subtracting 20 from both sides, 2s is 60. s, therefore, equals 30. And does it seem sensible? Well, I said before, don't read off the graph, but if you look, uh, S did seem to be about 30. B, uh, sorry, not B, E, oh, 5. Well, the graph wasn't accurate. And again, you mustn't read off the graph whether you've had to prepare one or you're given one. You can be tested on solving the equations, and that could be a little multiple choice question on its own. Um, I'm sorry repeating, but um, depending on how you were taught this at school, if you were taught it at school, um, there are other ways you could have arrived at the answer. There is only one correct answer. And so don't change your way. If you're already happy about solving the equations together, do it the way you're used to. If you've never done it or you've completely forgotten, then perhaps learn my way. I mean, the alternative, if you would have given the same answer, is if I'd multiplied the first equation by 1.5, it would have come to six e's, and I've had the same number of e's in both equations, we could then have worked out s and so on. However, we're not quite there yet, because of course, although we now know our optimal production plan will produce 30 standards and five executives, uh, the question did also want to know the, the maximum contribution, but that's now easy. Uh, the maximum contribution, uh, we had the equation before, contribution is 6s plus 9e. Well, s is 30. Um, e is 5. And so the total contribution will be 180 plus 45, it will be 225. And there we are. Uh, now, before I leave that, uh, one thing people are always asking me. Well, two things that people are always asking me. Uh, one is, instead of uh, solving those equations together, since I hope you understood, because I said earlier, uh, the, um, the best answer must be at one of those corners. Can we just, instead of doing what I did, could we just not just check what the profit is at each of those four corners, um, whichever is is the best? Well, the answer is yes, no problem. By all means, work out what it would be at point A. At point A, you're making zero E's and 30-something uh, S's. At point C, you're making 10 E's and I'm not sure how many S's, uh, by all means. But it takes longer, and again, you could be specifically tested on knowing this idea of moving on the objective function. The other question I get asked is, oh, do we need to draw a graph? You know, can we just not check where the lines cross? Well, no, for two reasons. One is the examiner wants to check you understand the graph, so you've got to understand the graph. The second is that if you didn't draw a graph and just checked where all the lines crossed, you'd be including that point as well. And without the graph, you wouldn't realise that that point wasn't even uh, a possible point whether the profit there was high or low would be irrelevant. 
Okay, fine. We've solved the problem, but unfortunately, we're still not there. Uh, because you could be asked more things, you'll see um, on the second page. Um, there's a paragraph mentioning spare capacity and shadow prices. So I'm afraid we're going to have another lecture where, for the same example, so be clear where we're up to, I'll go through and explain what we mean by spare capacity and shadow prices and how we calculate them.